everybody talks about how AI and you know machine learning is gonna completely revolutionize the space, and I completely agree. I can just see that in order to really utilize those technologies, we also need to have a focus on the quality of our data. The, the main challenges right now, and what is holding laboratories back from entering into the Industry 4.0 domain, mm. is the lack of interconnectivity. So out there, there is you know a lot of laboratory equipment which is functionally exactly as it should, but where the only limitation is just it is hard to connect um, to the internet or to the cloud or to whatever software platform. Hi, this is Joachim from uh, Green Innovation Group, here with another episode of the uh, Sustainable Healthcare Podcast. And uh, this episode, we are back with uh, Melde from, uh, from Inity to talk more about uh, digitalizing labs and what are some of the, the practical barriers for, for companies to overcome this? Uh, how can we start? And uh, also, what will labs look like uh, in 10 years? Uh, I really learned a lot from this episode, and it was just a joy to talk uh, with Melda. He's a very good communicator. Uh, it's seldom that, well, sometimes at least, where when people have uh, great technical uh, insights and an engineering background, uh, they can go very deep into the detail. But I think uh, Melda does a, a great job at, at communicating it so, so that everybody can understand. And uh, without further ado, here's the episode. Hi, Melda. Welcome back to the podcast. Thank Super you. Super excited to have you here again. In this podcast, we always talk about uh, decarbonizing healthcare uh, in all ways and forms. And uh, in the last episode uh, with you, we heard about uh, Inity Story, uh, the company that you helped co-found, uh, and how you uh, enable uh, companies that are that are doing good to to do the, do it faster uh, in life sciences, uh, ex uh, especially. In this episode, uh, we are we're going to talk about automating labs mm -hmm. and uh, what are some of the barriers, what are some of the potentials that are out there, including the sustainability potentials. Uh, so I'm curious if you could just give a brief intro into uh, just really short first, uh, what is it that Inity does? And then what is the status of the labs out there? So what we do is basically that we connect the whole laboratory to our software platform. Um, because out there, there is you know, a lot of laboratory equipment which is functionally exactly as it should. But where the only limitation is just it is hard to connect um, to the internet or to the cloud or to whatever software platform. Which means data is really scattered out to many different places. So what we do is that we have our little box, which is a little IoT enabler that we connect to all the laboratory uh, equipment in the laboratories. And that means we can, of course, gather all the data on our platform, but we actually also have bi-directional communication, meaning that we can also control the laboratory equipment. And that uh, allows the end user to build experiments with equipment from many different vendors, and all of a sudden they can speak together on, on one platform. And mm -hmm. that's something that's actually quite groundbreaking in the space. So, so as a researcher, I wrote up the Unity software on my laptop, either in the lab or outside of the lab, yes. and I can control the equipment and I can see my history of how uh, I have ran experiments. And exactly. Uh, yeah. So it was quite funny actually, some during COVID, you know, a lot of yeah. the laboratories shut down and we had, you know, our customers, they could c keep on working. Sometimes they of course has to be on site to fill up tanks and stuff yeah. like that, but then they could sit at home, control the experiments, monitor them, which actually allowed them to uh, continue working. That's um, amazing. So that's, yeah, uh, that was quite uh, interesting uh, to follow, um, given the circumstances of, coming, uh, of course. Um, and we can see that the state of the laboratory today is that it's an industry that have been, for many years, it's been dominated by, by uh, the hardware equipment manufacturers. You know, we have mm. Thermofish, Scientific, Metla, Toledo, and, and the list go on. And they have been focusing on de developing, you know, high quality hardware, and they're doing a very good job in that. Uh, and also, you can see if you look at historically, there's been a lot of, you know, groundbreaking innovations in the hardware uh, scheme of things. But I, what I believe now is that that will kind of change. We will still, of course, have uh, innovation there, but it will be more incremental, you know, better, better version of everything. Uh, but where I really think that the, the new game changer in laboratories will be is in the software space. 
and I'm not only saying this because I come from a laboratory software company, but actually because um, the, the main challenges right now and what is holding laboratories back from entering into the industry 4.0 domain mm. is the lack of interconnectivity. And then you might think, okay, why aren't all of these connected yet? And it's because each manufacturer, they have their own way to communicate with their mm. equipment. And also within the different manufacturers, they also have different ways. So that means, mm. you know, some are speaking Chinese, some are speaking French, Spanish, you know, mm. it's very hard uh, to, to for the end users to standardize this. And that is what we do. So we basically write drivers for all the laboratory equipment out there so we can automatically uh, communicate with our platform. Mm. And uh, without hopefully not offending uh, any equipment manufacturers, you can say they have maybe also not have an interest in standardizing uh, the way you communicate to equipment. Because if someone has spent a great deal of time on implementing a, for example, a scale from a certain brand into a process, then mm. the next time you need to, to buy a scale, you need to buy the same, the same one. Because mm. then all of a sudden, if for the equipment manufacturers, it's not a, a, a race towards the bottom in, uh, in pricing, I've yeah. seen it in, mother, in many other hardware industries. <coughs> but they can kind of keep people in the ecosystem yeah. uh, this way. There's a login effect. There's a login effect. And we see also some equipment manufacturers have started to launch their own software platforms, uh, but where they do it as a closed ecosystem. So that means they only allow their own laboratory equipment on yeah. this platform, which I don't believe in, because that's not what the end user want. Because mm. then all of a sudden you just have yet another generation of uh, data silos where you have, you know, one, you have your Metal Toledo platform, LabX, and you have your Time Official platform and so yeah. on. And from a user yeah. perspective, this is not what I want. Mm -hmm. So if you, uh, would it be fair to sum it up like that, that if you go into an average lab today, you will have a lot of really, really great uh, equipment from different manufacturers, but that are not connected, and where a lot of uh, results and processes are still highly dependent on a notebook and a pen and an Excel sheet. Yes, um, <coughs> definitely. And I think what, what all laboratories that I've been in, and I think all laboratories in the world almost, do have equipment from different manufacturers. Some are today connected to what is called a LIMP system, a laboratory information management system, which is kind of like what you do an ERP system like SAP, but mm. for laboratories. And some have a connectivity from the equipment to the LIMPs. But that's a very, <coughs> you could say, hard-coded way. It doesn't allow mm. the, the researchers to have the flexibility and the control over mm. their uh, experiments. And from day one, it was very important for us to say, OK, we want to put the researchers in control of what they're doing. You know, they should mm. not run to IT department every, thing, every time they want to do a small change, but mm. they actually need to be the one that can independently program and uh, automate an experiment. So we built a truly uh, user-friendly solution where just by you know, drag and drop programming can actually build quite a complex experiments. Mm. Because I think in order for digitalization um, to have an impact, it needs mm. to be you know, easy to do. And for, uh, in order to be a success, it needs to be something uh, where people keep doing what they like about the job. Yeah. And that is what I, we see is that, you know, it's a creative part of uh, science, like testing new things, and that mm. should be easily available for them. So they should not just be slaves of the digitalization. And that's mm. very important for us that we, they, they come in control of what they do in yeah. the laboratories. Um, and I think we have uh, succeeded so far with this and can also see that it frees up people's time. You know, it's not everybody that spent eight years at university that did it on to stand for five hours and push a button. <laughs> so yeah. they can actually focus on, you know, the more fun stuff, which is, you know, analyzing the data or coming up with new ideas, answering emails, you know, yeah. they also have to do that. Um, mm. So, yeah. No, that, that that's that's amazing. Uh, so if we uh, uh, zoom out of the individual lab mm -hmm. and, and really, like, uh, put it up at a high scale, let's say we, uh, for whole uh, pharma company mm. or, or whole hospital, what are the p potential opportunities mm -hmm. from from digitalizing labs, uh, both in terms of uh, business and operations, but also sustainability? Uh. Uh, <coughs> I would say interest. You know, yeah. I will do a, a five-page oh, yeah. book it. Yeah. on this, but uh, I will yeah. just try to give you the executive summary now. No, I think it's a lot about data integrity, uh, that you all of a sudden take the data directly from the equipment instead of having one to first either write it in Excel or down on a paper and then need to train for that. that yeah. That's a big 
big thing. And then it's also making your people uh, more efficient or make better use of their time. So instead yeah. of doing these repetitive things, they can actually do something that creates more value for the company, but mm. where they also feel more empowered uh, mm. because they, they do some more interesting stuff. So there's a very big, uh, can you say, a quality uh, mm. gain you can get from digitalization. There's a big efficiency gain. And then there's also just a big investment in the future. Because if you start to treat your data right, mm. then you will build up a significant database mm. of high quality data that you can utilize in the future. So you can start mm. finding these parents because everybody talks about how AI and you know machine learning is gonna completely revolutionize the space. And I completely agree. I can just see that in order to really utilize those technologies, we also need to have a focus on the quality of our data. And mm. that's what we can also help people with and where we can also have a, a big gain. Then what I also believe <coughs> is that there are you know, we are not the only software company in the space and we don't solve all the problems. But what we do help with is to get the data in your cloud. And that's where you need to start because then mm -hmm. you can all of a sudden say, okay, I would like to use uh, analytics tools from Sartorius. Fine, we can connect with them and boom, you have that easy to use. So it's also about making a lot of other cool technologies available to the customers. And I really believe that's something that, uh, that will, you will see a lot of development these years where you will have you know, an inter interconnected uh, s software suite uh, from different, many different uh, mm. software providers, yeah. which we highly support. Yeah, yeah so better uh, data integrity and by extension, uh, better, more uniform data storage and happier uh, lab workers who can spend more of their time uh, following their passion mm. and changing uh, uh, the world in, uh, in the way that they, they hope for. What are some of the potential uh, sustainability benefits that, that spurs off uh, from this? <coughs> There's, of course, if you start to uh, monitor the, your equipment usage, I think many yeah. organizations organization will find that there's not that high utilization of the mm. equipment. So giving people the awareness of this will allow them to minimize the, uh, the amount of uh, equipment they have and mm. thereby also the amount of space they need. That's, a, I think, is a, is a big uh, potential. And also the centralization of lab, as we spoke about uh, in, in the last episode. But also when you automate uh, your experiments, you also increase the quality. That means you have less failed experiments, less consumables, less raw materials, less rework, less energy. Mm. And another thing which we are doing a very interesting partnership with now is a company that uh, has a design of experiment uh, software, which is a term of a, a very statistical approach to design your experiments. So where you change one parameter at the time. And that means you can go for maybe having maybe to make 100 experiments to actually only have to make uh, 10 experiments because, and then you know how the different factors correlate. That means we can, together with this uh, very cool company, we can um, allow the end users to get the same insights, but with much less um, experiments. And I think what we'll also see in the coming years is that the equipment manufacturers, as we have uh, said, are also you know, introducing platforms, but they will also, is my, my mm. belief, in the near future start to say, um, because they live off selling you know, new equipment. So they need mm. to push out new equipment, which is great for them. It's not necessarily great for the environment, where they will say, okay, this one, it has a Wi-Fi module, or it has a uh, Bluetooth module, or whatever it can, but it can at least connect. And they will so say that's a unique thing. And maybe you know, some organizations, uh, or some customers will see that is a, a thing that adds a lot of value, which it does. But is that enough value to replace the whole uh, HPLC mm. or wherever mm. it can be? And what we do is that we say we make actually your existing laboratory equipment smart. Mm. So you can expand the lifetime of your equipment yeah. without having to replace it. Because it's a, maybe it's a great piece of equipment that just doesn't connect. Mm. Um, and, and I really believe that that can have a, a big impact. Um, That's a great point. It's, it's something that uh, in a completely different space, uh, but with uh, <laughs> fridges and, and ovens, and I, I see this spring out uh, all the time where you take uh, like perfectly good ovens and uh, people trust them to get an oven with Bluetooth. And it just feels like... But why do yeah. you need an oven with Bluetooth? I, I saw on a friend's <laughs> oven, it has Wi-Fi. <laughs> why? <laughs> yeah, yeah, because everything needs to have uh, Wi-Fi di wi fi these days. My, my dad bought a, a Bluetooth uh, oven or a, a Wi-Fi okay. oven, and now he can, can start and stop it from the sofa. But, but I, I think <laughs> this, is, this is a very uh, interesting aspect because it shows, you know, our ovens are connected, uh, mm. micro ovens, whatever in the, you have the, I have the Danfoss uh, yeah. app at home, you know, all yeah. these things are connected where it's just uh, people's spare time, which is, yeah. of course, precious. 
but the impact it could have if you did when you do the same thing in the laboratory mm -hmm. is so much greater yeah. but it just haven't happened yet but that's a it's a really interesting point so w what are some of the barriers i mean you you are out there uh, talking to uh, also a lot of other companies, but mm. also uh, pharma and life science companies, uh, maybe even hospitals or universities. Um, what are the barriers that you're meeting for for adopting this? Yeah, we c I can see the positive thing is in the four and a half years we have been going at it, mm. uh, there's really been an increased awareness of uh, of the need for digitalization. So mm. it now we often come out and people. You know, they're standing with the slides from the, the uh, strategic digital transformation uh, process. And that's where we could, uh, because people are aware that they need to do something here. Mm. But there is still a need for, for education, educating in the market, because it, what does digitalization mean in, in a lab context? So we spend, you know, time with our customers and understanding what is it you're trying to achieve? Like, what is it that's functioning very well today in the organization? And what is it mm. you want to do more of? And then we say, okay, this, this we can help you, you with in, in, in this manner. So it's a lot of... Um, it's a lack of knowledge about what digitalization mm. means in a laboratory context. Um, and then there's also maybe uh, when you, for example, say laboratory automation, people get pictures of, uh, you know, huge pipetting robots. Mm, and mm. that's not, not necessarily what it means. We can also automate, you know, simple setups. They can also have a huge impact. Then there is, of course, still uh, a bit fear of the cloud, mm. um, especially in the large organization where they have an IT policy where it needs to, you know, live up to the standards. But that can that's about communicating with the right stakeholders so that can be solved. Mm. But it, it's something that means things take more time and mm. also sometimes means that instead of deploying it on our cloud, then we deploy it on their cloud, which is fine by us. And it's also I also understand mm. where they're coming from through this because it is some quite uh, uh, crucial data for these organizations. Yeah, and they're all, uh, especially the, <coughs> either the commercial ones are super intellectual property uh, exactly. dri driven, so or if, if it's a hospital, uh, GDR, a GDPR is yeah. uh, so essential. It, of course, uh, it makes it makes perfect sense, um, mm -hmm. but it's it sometimes you also just need to say that cloud doesn't necessarily mean uh, insecure. Often mm. it actually mean, means quite the opposite. Mm. Um, but there is also some, some education there. But I think actually it's it's a joy being out there because people can nice. really see nice. how, how it uh, it changed things, and there is a high mm. willingness to mm. do, do one of those things. And I think the nice thing about us when we got out is that we can point. Uh, we are not, uh, you know, you're management consulting, but we are not. Mm. <laughs> so so that means we can actually tell them something concrete we can change for them. Yeah. Like we can can transform those slides into solutions and say, okay, this mm. is how it would look like, and we can get started pre pretty quickly. Because I think many also fear when they say laboratory digitalization. They think, mm. okay, then we spend yeah. uh, three years on, uh, on implementing this. And I don't believe that's the right approach. Mm. I think it, it needs to be where you pretty quickly get something in your hands and see how it impacts you. Oh, definitely. We, yeah. have a, we have a saying that there is no impact in the slides. No. And uh, <laughs> that's uh, because in, in, in so many of these uh, large healthcare organizations yeah. that we're working with, there's, there's an uh, abundance of slides and strategies yeah. and, and, and policies. but uh, that does not drive the CO2 down. Actual changes does, and, and that needs to be the result. Um. Exactly. And um, and getting something changeable. And then there is, of course, especially when you talk, talk farm and healthcare, there is some mm. compliance, and mm. uh, which, of course, it's there for a reason, but it, it means that things take more time. And that's, mm. that's just how it is. So the less regulated an industry is, the easier or mm -hmm. the faster it is to, you know, mm -hmm. get from a, hey, let's do that to implementation, mm -hmm. whereas the more regular, like when you're in the uh, GLP labs and mm -hmm. so on, it's, um, it's of course, it is jo just more complex. Mm -hmm. and um, What is GLP just for any listeners? Yes, uh, sorry, uh, it's yeah. a good laboratory practice, so it's yes. a way to operate a, a laboratory, um, which is, of course, they should have that, so it's nothing about that, but it just, yeah. and it just makes things more complex, and that's uh, for a reason. Definitely. Your mission is to fully automate labs, but you also know that that's an utopia. Oh, so that's so an autonomous laboratory. Uh, autonomous laboratory, yeah. yeah. So you're not, um, I mean, you're not replacing the lab workers, you're enabling them. Yeah, and, uh, exactly. And I think I think that that should be the goal with, with this, is to, to make more use of humans, because there will always need to be humans to you know, translate what we hear from mm -hmm. marketing into experiments, to idea, to products. But we can just see that uh, in the Western world, especially, there's a big lack of STEM talent, so mm -hmm. like uh, science, technology, yeah, engineering. Yeah, yeah. 
math. Math, I, yeah, yeah, math I think it's yeah. math. Let's yeah, go with yeah, math. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in order to overcome this challenge, we need to say, okay, if we need to stay competitive, then we need to get more out of the individual engineer or mm. scientist. And that we believe we can yeah. do. Um, yeah, I was just thinking about that, that there's a, there's a massive enablement, enablement in this on, on, uh, on, on several levels. Uh, both uh, the ability to operate laboratory equipment remotely. I mm -hmm. mean, you might have some uh, brilliant woman in India who uh, does not have the, the equipment that she needs, but that uh, she could be the best scientist uh, for this. But also you mentioned that uh, by using software to better design experiments or having guidelines uh, for all of these things, you. Uh, you can faster get creative mm. uh, and sort of uh, c cut out uh, subparts uh, of mm. the craft that it also is to um, to do research. That it's uh, I mean it, it's a lot of creativity and brilliant ideas, but there's mm. also a lot of it which is it's more like being a carpenter or yeah. something like that. That's exactly. That, uh, exactly. And and, mm. and I think that that's also wha why we believe that it's it's something that makes people's uh, yeah. life in the labs uh, more pleasant. Yeah. And also, you're back to the point about uh, many of these big research organizations they have mm. uh, R and D or QC or whatever facilities yeah. many places in the world. So with our solution, it's also a way to connect these further uh, yeah. together because they can actually follow what did my colleague in uh, Singapore uh, yeah. did while I was sleeping because maybe we're actually collaborating mm. on something. Um, so there's a much uh, easier way to prom perform knowledge sharing, both you know in yeah. real time, but also you know every time, every now and then, people change job. So instead of having to you know find their notebooks and ah, oh, what did you mean there? Yeah, you yeah. have a complete documentation mm. of the work they have done, and it's much easier to replicate. And what is sometimes interesting is also um, that when people are sitting, you know, ah, oh, should we try mm. out this new thing? Sometimes they try stuff that they have done before and failed or been yeah. a success or whatever because they don't have a, f a way to find all of this. Mm. So that's also just really about making the right data and the right uh, information available to the right people. Mm. Um, that can have a big impact as well. Oh, definitely. It's, uh, it's a new world for me as well. But the more I look into it, the more astonished I get um, how many uh, experience, experiments and parts of research that are being replicated, mm. uh, not as a as a double check that uh, yeah. I, I saw this paper. Let's see if we can replicate the results. Mm. But simply in the same organizations, uh, simply because uh, we are not aware. Yeah, that's insane. Yeah, but, but uh, 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 and it didn't. But it's the, the the more I look into it and talk to people, it's a very real thing. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. See, yeah. It will change eventually. Yeah, yeah. super exciting. Um, so. Where where is digitalization of of labs he heading? Uh, I mean, we're like you said. I mean, it's in our home, yeah. but it's not in the labs yet. Nope. But you you sort of found a, a way to to cross that chasm. So, ten years from now, how if I'm a lab worker, how will my day uh, be different from today? Mm. I think a lot of it will be the same. Um, you will have the same task. You will just, I think, you'll be able to do more with your time that you spend in the laboratory. And um, I think often when we talk with people that did a PhD or even the master, you know, they just spend hours and mm. weeks in the laboratory yeah. watching this experiment. So yeah. I hope it will be less painful, uh, mm. more enjoyable. Um, but I think a lot of the things will be the same. It will just run in a more uh, efficient uh, manner. Uh, mm. It will be more interconnected. You will have way more tools available to analyze your data. You will have way more uh, data available mm. and, a, and a, at a much higher quality. And also, I really believe in 10 years, everything will be connected. We see some trends right now. There are two um, consortium. There is uh, Spectaris uh, and Sila 2. One is mainly American, one is European, uh, working on making a standard uh, for how you communicate to laboratory uh, equipment. And uh, are b both kind of based on what is called OPC UA, which is a standard. And the challenge about this is, you know, already now we have two, two standards being developed on. So mm. what I fear is that, okay, then we don't get the golden standard, but then we get yet another two standards. But it's, mm. I think it's too early to, to conclude anything on that. But I can just see, like we're now we are talking about the standard, 
Then next we have agreed, mm. and then we need to actually spread it out. And and the challenge for equipment manufacturers is that they have quite uh, long development cycles, and it's mm. quite expensive, and uh, it's a big thing to change, you know, mm. uh, the electronics of, of a product. So it will take quite some time before it get out to the market. But we really, you know, support this. So what we can see is that we can help bridge the gap from where we are now to we have it implemented as a standard in the product because I'm sure that will come. Mm. And I also really hope that the equipment manufacturers will. Uh, use some standardized interfaces. And I also think that's here where the, the customers, you know, the big organizations, they have mm. the buying power. They are the power of the market and they should be aware of this. Mm. So when they buy, you know, billions krona of laboratory equipment, you also should you know, uh, use that power to say, no, we want it to be with a standard interface. We don't want uh, mm. 40 different interfaces here because it needs to be market driven mm. uh, because else, you know, the equipment And we want, it, uh, we want it more sustainable and we want, we want it more connected so we can... Uh, exactly. Turn it on and off uh, exactly. when we need exactly. it. Exactly, and, and, and yeah. I think, of course, some of this will come from the equipment manufacturer yeah. themselves, but it's just, you know, that's the position uh, that people sitting in the laboratories have. They have yeah. the power of buying, yeah. and that's also what, what can help shape in uh, which direction the yeah. equipment uh, manufacturer uh, is going. Mm. Yeah, definitely, and that's another great, uh, we did another uh, episode on Green Labs uh, with Nicoline, and one of her points was that uh, sometimes it's hard for uh, a lot of lab users are actually very passionate about the green transition, but mm. they sort of have to leave that part uh, of their identity or their morals at the door. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And we will probably never get to a place where uh, labs are uh, sustainable in and by themselves because they mm. I, it's just a very uh, resource heavy process doing research of course by uh, the results from the lab is what yeah. enables uh, so so I, I I really like that potential here but I think um, we can improve a lot and I think that uh, oh I, definitely I know definitely Nicolina yeah. has a big focus on it and yeah. she's all about it and I completely agree agree with her but I also think she is also spending a lot of her time on educating people about it yes because if you go out to the average uh, lab user you know mm. Maybe they don't necessarily need to leave that uh, personality trait at mm. the door, but what we need to enable them to is to figure out what is it that they can do in the daily routine. Maybe mm. this shutting off uh, this yeah. machinery that's just running without anybody using it. It is to try and help to make it more transparent. Where is it that we use a lot of energy? Where is it we use a lot of materials? Yes. And then see, is there any way we can change in that? And I think digitalization can be a bit part of it, but I also think actually education uh, can be because yes. I'm not sure, I, I just recently became aware of, of how, how much energy some of this laboratory equipment uh, actually use. And if people knew, you know, if you just put, you know, a red sticker saying, okay, three households per year for this for this machine, mm. maybe people would be more inclined to turn it off yeah. because... Yeah, and the individual lab user, I mean, it's uh, like, tur turn this off for... Uh, for, for for an hour and you save the flight tickets and yeah. it's, it's, it's that uh, it's, yeah, exactly. it's that big for 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 some of it uh, yeah exactly yeah and that uh, that that's a great point and also like you said if um, digitalization can help us to do more uh, efficient experiments so mm. that either experiments are shorter uh, yes. or they don't fail as often that has a huge impact as well yeah uh, definitely and then along with as mentioned the uh, make people aware of the utilization, which mm. means that next time maybe they don't need three of this machine, maybe they just oh. know one that limits the space they need. Then hopefully in the same go, we can also start to show them what, how much energy does this machine use, so they can have a focus on maybe we should uh, turn it off or maybe we should uh, pack our experiments together um, because they can be done a lot of things uh, mm. quite easily. There's a lot of low hanging fruits out there. It's a bit uh, outside of Inity's uh, topic, but how do you see the interplay between um, digitalization of physical laboratories and then virtual laboratories uh, coming as well? So, so mm. laboratories that, I mean, either it can be uh, training, of course, through VR others, but it could also be uh, um, running uh, subtypes of experiments that, that never enter the, the physical lab. Uh. Yeah. I think uh, the last part is yeah. very exciting where we see some, you know, uh, startups that are using artificial intelligence to scan through, you know, 
all literature in the world or whatever yeah. to sign and say, okay, how do we design molecules for different applications? You know, that can save a tremendous amount of time and also re resources. Mm. But of course, at some point, they will need to take them out of the computer and actually test them in a real life application. For sure. yeah. But especially I really believe pharma. <laughs> it's especially pharma. <laughs> yeah. No, um, but I really believe that will have a big impact on it, um, and it it already have uh, in some some uh, cases I've seen. It's quite impressive what what can be done there. Um, so I think, in some sense, if we go back to a question about how will the laboratory look in 10 years, I think this will also be a much greater part of it, uh, because there is mm. some, when you have sufficient amount of data, and you can to some extent predict, if we do this, what will happen. Mm. Um, but there will always be a need to uh, do it, at least within the my, my understanding, to, to, no, to I test I it in real so life, um, mm. of course. But this can be pushed later and later in the process, uh, which is interesting. And I also think this is something that can help a lot in the upscaling, uh, mm. because then you can maybe try to simulate, okay, fine, we do this maybe at the uh, 0.5 liters now. What does it look like when you do that 500 liters? And I think being able to predict this uh, can make the upscaling much easier and can also uh, make the produ production more efficient with us really some stuff to gain as yeah, well. Yeah, definitely. But we will and uh, that's, yeah, that's a whole different discussion. Yeah. Uh, we are in Green Innovation Group uh, working on uh, a pilot for an uh, LCA uh, calculator and, and database for, for clinical studies uh, yeah. at the moment, which is exactly that. that there's so much that happens in the R&D phase mm. that ends up being highly influential on the production yes. phase. And yes. of course, R&D and clinical trials are quite big emitters by themselves, yeah. but but they also create massive lock-in effects yeah. uh, for production, because when something comes through the FDA, you, you can't really change how it's viewed. It's very hard. At it's least not an agile uh, uh, process. No, no, it's the opposite. <laughs> no. It's exactly the, the opposite. Yeah, so, so yeah, a lot of uh, exciting stuff there. That's interesting. Yeah, thanks. Um, hope to uh, to do an uh, an episode about that once we can go uh, official okay. at uh, at one point. Um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, thank you for having me, Melde. Uh, it's a joy. I hope uh, a lot of the, the listeners uh, have gotten an appetite for for digitalizing uh, their labs and and seeing that. It doesn't have to be all that different. Uh, you can take their existing equipment and processes and, and make it smart. It's not scary. It's Digitalization not sc is your friend. Digitalization <laughs> is your friend. Uh, if uh, Skynet comes <laughs> in, uh, in, in, in in 10 years, uh, we'll, we'll pin you up on that. Okay. But, uh, uh, so far, so good. So far, so good. Yeah. yeah. No, no, I, I agree. Um, cool. Thank you. Have thank a great you. Day. That was a really exciting episode for me. Uh, it's it's really really uh, joyful joyful for me to to do this episode. I'm I'm always thankful for how much I learned from our guests. Um, decarbonizing healthcare is a massive mission. Uh, it's such a large industry. Uh, it's it's highly regulated, and at the end of the day. Uh, the, the treatments and the drugs still need to get out to the patient uh, in, a, in a safe and efficient way. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there's not so many things uh, we can do to make the healthcare industry greener. Um, and uh, yeah, learning from, uh, from my guests it's, is always uh, humbling and, and really, really uh, enjoyable. Um, we're also doing uh, a lot of, uh, of green projects ourselves uh, in uh, Green Innovation Group, um, both in, in medtech, pharma and, and healthcare. Um, so uh, if you want to learn more uh, about the, the projects that we do and uh, how we help uh, companies with their sustainability strategy, both in formulating the strategy and in executing on it, Go check out uh, greenandracinggroup.com. Uh, we work all the way from clinical and R&D to uh, production and, and commercial. Uh, and it's just, uh, I did an episode about it the other day uh, on the, uh, the state of sustainability in the healthcare industry. And it's just a, such a joy to see the pace that we're changing at in the moment. It's still early days, but it's coming into more and more tenders from the procurement departments. There's um, serious efforts between uh, uh, or being put uh, towards uh, making the companies green. 
And of course, there's still a massive, massive execution gap uh, between the, the commitments uh, that the companies have set for 2030 or 2050. So a lot of work that needs to be done, but uh, it's, it's really picking up and it's just a joy to be a part of. Have a great day out there. Uh, and this was the Sustainable Healthcare Podcast with Green Innovation Group.